Hey, what's up? John Hansen here. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Your week 11 waiver wire report here at fantasypoints.com. On the video feed, we do the big article every week on the website. I go in, I pull out my top 15 pickups for the week. It's been going pretty well. I feel like we've been ahead of the curve on a lot of dudes here, but there have been a lot of dudes. Before I get into this week's pickups, if you will, just a little bit of a, a strategy point. I used to, back before I did uh, fa fantasy football, fantasy sports radio every day, which has been like during the season now of 13, 14 years, I used to do a strategy column. Uh, I'm not really great uh, at, at doing that in, at this stage of my life, but I certainly have strategy tips. And here, here's a very basic one because that waiver wire is is very fruitful lately, but not a lot of dudes stick. I, I went through and I looked at, I tried to figure out about like, I came up with a list of 60 guys who I think were picked up on most waiver wires. Let's say over half of leagues, 12 teams and larger. And then I went through and I, I looked at, okay, here are the dudes. How many of these guys actually stuck? And it came out to about 18%. So that's not great. That's like, you know, you're a 180 hitter in Major League Baseball on the waiver wire. So you are getting some options who are helpful for a week or two. But again, not much sticks. There's competition. The coaches kind of jockeying dudes for position in, in certain situations, certain positional battles, an extra dude gets thrown into a backfield, you know, like Keaton Mitchell, all of a sudden he's viable. Uh, we'll see if that one sticks. The point strategy wise was, you know, your draft bottom half of your draft. And I said this a lot this past year kind of means nothing. You're, you're going to be swinging and missing once you get past like the top, I think it's about 80 picks nowadays, 75, 80, 90, maybe. I don't even know if it gets to 100, but we can even call it 100. So that's kind of what I was saying this summer. Like, we got to get our draft picks right early. You know, those critical, obviously, those first, second, third rounders, but, you know, those fifth, sixth, seventh rounders, you know, could have got Jordan Addison this year, most likely, for example, in round number seven. So, you know, let's get those picks right. Let's really focus in next year in the draft. And I'll write about this in the off season, but we got to get this right. And we also, by the way, I think need to focus more than ever on early portion of the season. You know, unfortunately I'm a person, I've been doing this a long ass time. And when I break down players nine times out of 10, I'm breaking them down for the entirety of the season. So you have guys getting off to slow starts. People email me, yo dude, I'm one in five, man. You screwed me. Yet, and then the dude that I liked takes off and he finishes exactly where I thought he would. That's that's happened more times than I'd like to even recount or even recall. But I think going forward for me, I am really just focusing on, you know, I say there's seasons within the season. I am focusing on seasons like two and three. And I'm going to take it from there because let me reel off this name. Uh, this list of names on the waiver wire. I don't want to bore people uh, reeling off 60 names, but it, it is somewhat startling. Like, for example, in terms of not sticking, this may blow some people's minds. I was actually shocked that this happened in 2023. Through week three, Mac freaking Jones was the QB 13, higher than Brock Purdy, Dak Prescott, the immortal Sammy Howell, and, and, Many others, uh, certainly Trevor Lawrence. But here, here's a bunch of names that I believe were picked up at one time on the waiver wire. Mostly were undrafted, but there's a couple of guys here who probably got thrown back into the waiver wire pool here. I'm going to go by position here. C.J. Stroud, Howell, Baker, Gardner Minshew, Stafford, Carr, Garoppolo, Devon A. Chan, uh, Jalen Warren, Jerome Ford, Deontay Foreman, Kyron Williams, Kareem Hunt, Keaton Mitchell, Chuba Hubbard, Tajay Spears, Gus Edwards, Devin Singletary, Ty Chandler, Jaleel McLaughlin, Samaje Piran, Roshan Johnson, Zach Moss, Elijah Mitchell, Daryl Henderson, Amari DiMarcato, Josh Kelly, Michael Wilson, Jonathan Mingo, Brandon Cooks, Jamison Williams, Josh Reynolds, Jaden Reed, Tank Dell, Noah Brown, Josh 
Downs, my guy, Zay Jones, Rishi Rice, Josh Palmer, Puka Nakua was a waiver wire pickup. Tutu Atwell, KJ Osborne, Demario Douglas, Kendrick Bourne, Rashid Shaheed, Wandale Robinson, Curtis Samuel, Trey McBride, Zach Ertz, Janu Smith, Dalton Kincaid, Cole Komet, Jake Ferguson, Luke Musgrave, Dalton Schultz, Gerald Everett, Michael Mayer, Logan Thomas, and Hunter Hendry. Per my calculations, I only have like 12 or 13 of these dudes really sticking more than, let's say, two, three weeks. So that's only about 18%. So uh, I guess this is all a little bit of a prelude to what I'm looking at to do on the waiver wire uh, this time of the year here, going into week number 11. First and foremost, hopefully I drafted well and I've been working that wire, you know, building depth the whole way. And again, you know, a guy who looked like a good depth piece six weeks ago is probably dead. Uh, not not actually dead, but dead for fantasy purposes. That's just the way uh, things are going. But I, I would like to consolidate as much as I can. You know, if I somehow have, you know, two really good tight ends, let's say, uh, maybe a Dalton Kincaid and I don't know, maybe I got Trey McBride now balling. Uh, you know, maybe trade one of those and you say, oh, well, there's a Kate Otten on the waiver wire if need be kind of a deal. Uh, first, I'd like to consolidate. Then I want to pick up backup types, you know, for my running backs, my handcuffs, if I if I can, if there's anything of note there. But otherwise, I, I am looking for needle movers. I am looking for, you know, high impact guys. A lot of these guys might be volatile, but I just reeled off a list of 60 people who most of whom were actively picked up on the waiver wire. And many people spent a lot of fake dollars on these people and only 18% of them actually really worked or stuck. So when we're out here making pickups, might as well go for upside potential and needle moving potential. And most of the time that comes in the form of young players. So let me get into it now. Uh, we'll start at running back with Ty Chandler. I think I mentioned him before. I'm sure I did last week. I actually did a video on Ty Chandler uh, here on the feed back in July. Uh, we were, I guess, looking for content, but I, I just thought he was a dominant and rough. I was always a fan of his coming out of North Carolina. He essentially replaced uh, Javante Williams there, and he was very good. He's not a big guy, but you know he ran hard uh, with a sense of urgency, pretty violent runner, uh, yet he you know ran well and good receiver. So clearly, as we've been noting here on the website, I've been talking about it since the summer, they, they have been looking for um, some auxiliary uh, contributions in the backfield, get some speed out there and some juice because Alexander Madison is uh, not really uh, not a big numbers guy, you know, like none of the, the data on Alex Madison was any good, basically. Fantasy points data, by the way, um, was not good. And we were not in on him, by the way. I don't know where the other people were, the other uh, so-called experts. Uh, not us. Uh, you know, we do get things wrong, too. But I really have struggles uh, leaning a little too heavily on volume. And that's what you're doing. Uh, now, look, it's working out with Rashad White, my guy there, but Rashad White is one of the best receiving backs I've ever seen. And I said that this summer, by the way, and well, he's right now on pace to break the NFL record for the highest catch rate. But I digress. We want younger players. And clearly, uh, look, let's just take this all the way. We saw what he did last week. It wasn't great on a per carry basis, but he did look shot out of a cannon on some plays. Now, it's unlikely, but. I do think it's within the realm of possibility that Ty Chandler starts getting the ball and starts getting into a rhythm. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh wow, this guy's got some pop. So if that should occur, then I have no doubts that he could usurp Alexander Madison as their primary back. Let's call it that Madison. I'm sure would still play again. Ty Chandler, very good receiver. I talked with him about it at the combine. I like I said, I liked him. So I set up an interview with him. Uh, great dude. Real good dude. And uh, you can line him up out wide. He can run routes like a receiver. So that's a good one right there. Potential needle mover. Only owned in 7% of Yahoo leagues coming out of week 9. And, uh, well, technically coming out of week 10, but going into week 11, that'll change soon as waivers run. Next up, and I wrote this 
in the uh, my top 15 list last week. This is what I wrote because, you know, Noah Brown kind of did look like a one-hit wonder uh, last week. I think, oh, what was it? Robert Woods was out and he returned this week. But, you know, I, I, I have always been somewhat intrigued by Noah Brown. You know, like he's a guy that sat there on the Cowboys for a long time. Uh, and, you know, he was a pretty good prospect there uh, coming out of college. But this is what I wrote. Worth a shot on the chance that his ascension continues and he proves to be impossible to keep off the field. Well, I certainly believe that the case for that uh, phenomenon occurring improved dramatically in week number 10. Obviously, C.J. Stroud absolutely balling. Um, next up, a guy that I talked about last week, yet still only owned in 36% of Yahoo leagues. I get it. Maybe, you know, 10, 12 team league, you know, he's a little boring, but you know, for those in PPR leagues where a dude who's going to catch five, six balls on the regular uh, moves the needle, Demario Douglas uh, for the New England Patriots. Now, it is unfortunate in that they might have 0.0 good quarterbacks on the roster, but in a weird way, a guy like Demario Douglas, little inside possession receiver, I mean, I could probably get this guy the ball. So sometimes you see these bad quarterbacks leaning on Douglas, which – Maybe going on right now, as my man has got 20 grabs for 217 yards on 29 targets the last four weeks. He's got three carries for 24, and that may surprise you uh, to learn. But my man right here is wide receiver 27 uh, without a touchdown over the last four weeks. I am clearly watching That's a Hold uh, Monday Night Football right now, just going into the second round or second half here. Uh, first play i think of the second half but we digress and move on to zach charbonnet now look he might be a tease but he's been well over 50 percent of the snaps uh the last three games i was kind of agnostic on him to be honest uh in the pre-draft process uh, i was kind of waiting to see where he went then when he went to seattle um i didn't have a very very strong opinion on him i am a little bit of a ken walker hater though uh ken the bouncer but I really like what I see from Charbonnet. Um, again, over 50% of the snaps the last three games. He's got five to ten touches in those games, ten touches this past week, coming off his best showing of the season in a very hard-fought game that was down to the wire. Six carries for 44, and he caught four of five targets for 18. And uh, not trying to be hyperbolic here, but I really, truly believe if Ken Walker misses time, Zach Charbonnet is a like an elite RB1. I know that sounds crazy, but you're, you're talking about a three-down skill set. You're talking receiving chops. You're talking the ability to rip off a long run, short yardage, You know, getting downhill, looking really good. Moving on to a guy who was a favorite of mine um, and Tajay Spears. Ironically, I remember now being right – close to Zach Charbonnet, he was being interviewed a booth over from me interviewing Tajay Spears, uh, actually. And I, I just kind of observed Charbonnet just for what it's worth. Seems like an amazing dude, like a really nice guy. Uh, Spears too. I love me some Tajay Spears. I've been giving him love uh, way back since last February, honestly. But I do think we're inching a little closer to him being their running back of the future and the present uh, because they they well they are the next to last in the AFC I know they're only what a couple of games out uh, technically uh, but I, I don't think they're going to win well they do have a couple winnable games but uh, it does seem like they are turning the page or they're about to or at least they would be very open to it come December uh, and Tajay Spears another one you know That'd be a tough call for me. Like Tajay Spears or Zach Charbonnet, both guys leading their team, primary backs, damn near foundational backs, both getting 20 touches a game. Who do you like better? I mean, Charbonnet's situation is a lot better, uh, but I got to go Spears because Spears is absolute magic. Uh, here's another guy that I really liked and did videos on. Um, and he's a waiver wire guy. I'm not saying he's, you know, blowing up or anything like that, but I'm a Jaden Reed guy. Uh, I was not that big on Christian Watson uh, 
he wasn't one of my, my guys. Uh, I wouldn't uh, qualify him as such. But on the lower end, I would qualify uh, Jaden Reed as such. And, you know, I went on a limb with Christian Watson this week on Sirius XM. I kind of predicted a big play. In my defense, he got – how many balls did he have thrown to him in the end zone? Uh, of course, granted, like, they got picked, but – uh, he had multiple opportunities in the game to make big plays and he dropped a lot of balls and then they didn't go to him as much. And then the matchup came through that I was seeing and Jaden Reed made those big plays. And I think we can argue at this juncture and our guy, Brett Whitefield at the senior bowl, uh, watched, uh, Jaden Reed practice for a week with, with me and, uh, our guy, Chris Weck. He said after that, you know, once he was drafted by Green Bay, he kind of viewed him as their best number one receiver. And I certainly didn't disagree because Jaden Reed lined up mostly outside at Michigan State. Then they asked him to go inside at the Senior Bowl week practice and he kicked ass. He was, guy was open all the time. Uh, so, and he's done that here in the NFL. And he stepped up in week 10 and Chris, Christian Watson ha, continues to be a train wreck. So, on the chance that we're catching lightning in a jar, and I do like the schedule, we'll get to Jordan Love in a moment. You know, Jaden Reed uh, is is the kind of needle moving guy that has a chance to kind of like maybe not just take off like a rocket ship, but kind of you know steadily get a little bit better and average like four and a half grabs a game for. 60 yards and scoring every other week or something like that. And you add it all up. It's pretty good. Uh, here's some other names as we move along in the same, you know, mindset, Quentin Johnston. I, I was not a Quentin Johnston guy at all. I, I didn't really love watching him catch a football and I thought he was a little raw and all that good stuff, but Hey, they need him. Um, Josh Palmer's on IR. Mike Williams is long gone. And I can tell you this as a person who thought Gerald Everett might actually have a chance? He doesn't. Uh, he never has. And I've never been an Everett guy, but I did kind of look at him the last few weeks. I'm like, you know, they need him, but they don't throw to him. See, that's a problem. Uh, so, therefore, I think they need Quentin Johnson to step up. Uh, here's um, a couple more Michael Wilson for the Arizona Cardinals, another senior bowl guy. Uh, Flashed a little bit in week 10. Kyler looked good. Really nice spot. You know, defenses aren't going to necessarily be up at night worrying about Michael Wilson. You know, it's Hollywood Brown is a legit one. Trey McBride is a dangerous tight end right now, as dangerous as they get in the National Football League. So that's a good environment for him. And then last but not least, I will get to Jordan Love. Um, absolutely has issues. Leads the NFL with 10 interceptions. I remember doing a big video on Jordan Love and I kind of laid it all out, trying to figure it out. And, you know, the conclusion that I came to was that it was probably going to work out, uh, at least in the fantasy realm, because I, I think people were underrating, you know, what he was going to bring to the table as a runner. Now that all said, you could argue it's not working out. You could argue he stinks and you might be right. However, I am talking fake football here, and it may surprise you to learn this, but my man Jordan Love is on pace for 30 touchdowns, and that is on the heels of a month-long slump, month-plus long slump without Aaron Jones, with a couple of other guys in and out of lineup. They do have a pretty good schedule. I kind of feel like you, you want to use him against teams that will play a lot of man. And he does have a few of those upcoming, like the Lions, the Chiefs, Giants, Chiefs. Uh, so I feel like Jordan Love's going to be okay. Don't watch the game, but if he's been dropped, and I know he's available in over 60% of the Yahoo leagues, at the very least, if you're looking for a backup that you can use in a pinch, who's got legit 20 point potential, I would submit to you one Jordan Love. Uh, and also, his tight end, Luke Musgrave, is coming on a little bit as well. I'll wrap it up here. Went a little longer, got into some strategy, but check out the entirety of the waiver wire report at fantasypoints.com. We'll update that on, you know, usually early in the week. Uh, once a waiver's run, we 
uh, focus on the week to come. But that's it for now. I'm John Hanson. Thanks for watching the video, liking, subscribing, all that good stuff. We'll catch you next time.